Hello and welcome to the Tillage Edge with me, Michael Hennessy. This is your podcast for all your tillage news and advice. Environmental concerns have risen to the top of every agenda over the last number of years, and agriculture is constantly challenged to reduce its environmental footprint. Water quality is one of these key areas which is looked at by all regulators from the EU to your local county council. In this episode, I chat with Fiona Doolan, an ASAP advisor in Chagas, who's involved with farmers in tackling water quality issues. I first asked Fiona what ASAP stands for and what the programme is set up to achieve. ASAP stands for the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Programme, which is quite a long name. Um, But essentially what it is, is an advisory service that's available to farmers who are farming in areas where water quality is an issue. So currently we have 190 areas in the country which have deemed to be priority areas where we need to see an improvement in water quality and the ASAP programme is available um, freely and confidentially to farmers in those areas to try to help them to do what they can do to, to carry out their part. I suppose the underlying issue is that water quality is quite a hot topic. We have agreed targets that we need, need to meet with the EU and the ASAP programme is seen as a vital part in helping the farming community to do their part. Okay. So Fiona, how were those um, catchments or, or water body, body areas, how were they identified? I suppose the initial works were all carried out by the EPA uh, who looked at different catchments or areas as we call them across the country um, to identify areas where water quality has been declining or where there have been risks identified areas that will not meet um, our water quality targets and we've looked at a number of those and prioritised them. That's where the 190 come from. They're right across the country. They're actually in in every county in Ireland um, and cover, I suppose, all different soil types and interestingly, all different enterprise types as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Is the is the is the problems? You're saying that they're all the way across the country, but are the more associated with, or maybe a lot of people would would suggest they might be more associated with intensive areas. Yeah, I suppose this is something even myself before I entered this program would have had preconceived notions, maybe about where issues were or weren't. And I suppose it's interesting when you look at those areas, as I said. Um, they're right across the whole of Ireland. So we're talking, you know, even the West, Southwest, as well as the Southeast, Midlands. So it's a complete geographical spread and it does cover all enterprise types. I think it's something that we need to recognise that water quality is driven by other factors rather than just solely the type of farming that's been carried out in an area, but can also take in things like the soil type, the land that farmers are trying to manage. Um, so it's, it's much broader than just is there a cow in the field or is there a tractor in the field? It's known much more about the land, how it's been managed, how best to manage it and the risks that that land type and those enterprises bring together in the overall picture. I suppose many farmers would probably think to themselves, well, hang on there now a second, that, that, that's fine and you identifying of where, where I might be at fault or where I might be able to improve, but I'm not the only one in this catchment. Um, there's lots of houses out there, there's big housing states, there's mm-hmm. towns, there's industries. How do we identify or has, has it been identified what problems are associated with the farming end versus non-farming, if you like? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there are a lot of other things going on in these areas besides farming, Michael. Um, you, know, you only have to look at you know, the wastewater treatment plants around towns and villages or even septic tanks or industry, the other things you mentioned there. And I suppose that's what is different about this ASA program in that we're approaching this collaboratively with the help of other people. So I suppose initially just to say that the ASA advisors themselves are made up a mix of uh, Chagask advisors, 20 like myself and 10 from the dairy industry, but that we have the support of an organization called LawPro, the Local Authority Waters Program. And these are the catchment scientists. So exactly as you say, these are the people who will go into one of these areas and really tease out what are the pressures in this area? What is affecting water quality here? Is it indeed agriculture or is it some of these other pressures? So their job as scientists is to go in, um, really get to grips with what's going on, what is actually affecting this area, what's going wrong here. And then, then if the issue is 
relating to agriculture, surely they can come back to us. But if it's not, and it's one of the other things, like we'll say the, the wastewater treatment plants or industry, whatever it is, refer it to whatever the, you know, the proper organisation is for to look after that. So we're not going in blindly into areas and laying the fault at anyone's door. There's a, a lot of, of work goes on in the background to establish, first and foremost, what really is going on here. This sounds like a new approach. Um, where lots of other different people are involved in it, as you say. But would a farmer have any difficulty or concern that these people are looking at this area and uh, that they're, they might end up being in trouble by having something slightly wrong on their farm? You, you, well, you're absolutely right in that this is a very different approach. If you think in the past, it, problems like this would have been dealt with through regulation or inspection or penalties. But the ASA program is about, um, I think, a little bit more carrot and a little bit less stick in ways, Michael, in that we're approaching these areas with advice and support rather than more rules or penalties. Um, and as I said to you, the, the ASA program itself, you know, it, it's free to a farmer, but it's also confidential to a farmer. So whatever the ASA advisor and he or she talk about stays but in just between the two of those people. It doesn't get passed on to any other body so it really is a confidential service to try and best come to you know what will work um, on a farm um, and just to go back to, to your to your other point about you know the, the catchment teams out walking these areas they're not interested in what's going on in a farmer's yard or essentially what's going on on the farm they're only interested in the stream itself and what's happening it so, you know, they, they really are um, looking at it from the point of view of the stream itself, rather than what's going on in the farmer's, you know, operation. That's only something that he and the asset advisor will talk about if and only if agriculture really has been identified as an issue in the area. So, no, I, I, just to finish your point, I, I don't think there is any reason for a farmer to be concerned. Um, and I think that's reflected in the overall figures, Michael, in that, over 95% of the farmers that ASAP advisors have made contact with over the last two years have engaged with the service, have had their ASAP advisor out and have gone through their farm and their farming system with that ASAP advisor. So if 95% of farmers are engaging with it, I think that's, that's a credit to the farming community who are obviously willing to engage with this and like the idea of advice and information and being kept into the in the loop because we all all you know very frequently find that farmers know they have a river or stream close to them but they've never really been informed before about the condition of that stream or, or what's going on with it so it is really um i suppose support and advice that farmers have uh, have deemed is worthwhile and have been very very willing overall to engage with and I think that'd be kind of a, an, an opinion I would have been getting from um, tillage farmers over the last probably five years. Their concerns uh, as regards the environment has, have always been relatively high, but have certainly increased over the last while. But if we bring it just back a little bit, Fiona, back to, um, to, to, to tillage farms, and are there differences between tillage farms, the, the, the problems you might be seeing out there or, or where you might um, uh, improve in comparison to grassland farms? Yeah, I suppose just to give you a brief idea, in the past two years, ASAP advisors have engaged with over 1,500 farmers. So that's 1,500 farmers who've had us out onto their farms to talk about water quality. About 20% of those, Michael, have been either specialised tillage farmers or who have a tillage enterprise on their farm. So there have been a quite an, a number of engagements with tillage farmers. I suppose to look at those... Um, Specifically for a minute, I, I would come away from the idea that, that a farmer is you know, just in tillage or tillage mixed with something else. I think what we've had the advantage in this program is of, of looking at the whole farm, you know, the system he's farming, the land he's farming, the soil type he's farming, the risks that's there in that particular area. And I think you know, that, that's, been, uh, uh, you know, that's been something of interest to farmers to look at you know, what they're working with and how connected that is to whatever the water quality issue might be in the area. That said, I suppose, uh, you know, traditionally, I think we think of tillage farmers as probably working on some of the better soils in the country, certainly probably some of the more freer drain and workable soils. 
and that itself can you know it can be associated with more risk from one area uh, rather than another say if you're in a more marginal um poorer draining or moderately draining land so the soil type is somewhat related to the enterprises i think you'll probably agree and that brings a kind of a certain risk with it uh, that you might not see on a different type of soil so then Fiona, in these predominantly tillage areas, if you like, rather than just a, a, a tillage farm, um, what are the issues that are uh, arising in those areas? It's interesting to look at, at what we've, I suppose, what we've seen so far in the two years of the programme. Um, and again, maybe my preconceived notions when I entered, I would have thought, well, a lot of these water quality issues would have been around maybe farmyards or point source pollution or things like that. But in actual fact, that's probably the smaller part of, of the problem um, what we found so far is about 15 percent of the, the farms we've been to their main issue is around farmyards and, and point sources the biggest issue we've uh, seen as acid advisors on the ground relates to nutrients so like i'm talking about nitrogen and phosphorus loss off farms and i suppose particularly when you look at tillage areas and you're probably looking at that um, like i say better draining type soil Certainly, um, nitrate loss, nitrate leaching is one that comes up regularly in those tillage areas. Approximately about 17% of the farms we've visited so far would have nitrate leaching as an issue, and a lot of those would have been those tillage or mixed tillage farms. So it certainly is one of the bigger ones. Okay, so when you get to a farm, you, there's nitrate leaching identified uh, in, in that farm or soil type. What sort of actions are you recommending to help mitigate that? Okay, I suppose the good news is that there are things we can talk about. They're not things that every farmer will view as being possible all of the time on their farm, but at least there are options we can look at. And I suppose, you know, the first one we talk about is probably the least, um, maybe the least revelatory of, of, all, of all kind of actions, but it comes back down to what you've spoken about many times, soil fertility, pH, phosphorus, potash, because what we're looking at with nitrate leaching is improving the utilisation efficiency of the nitrogen that the farmer does apply. So getting the basics right, I suppose, you know, and talking to them about that, because the better efficiency we can get out of the nitrate we apply means obviously more money in his pocket, but it also means a less risk of that being, you know, excess amounts being applied. We often see if there is a problem with pH or fertility on the farm, that a farmer can use more nitrogen to try and compensate for that when in actual effect, maybe he's not addressing, you know, the, the first uh, problem that he has and to, to get better use out of the products that he is using. So maybe that's, you know, least newest on the block, but it's still terribly important. Um, but certainly, Michael, I think the biggest tool that uh, in the toolbox that a tillage farmer can look at to mitigate against nitrate loss, loss is coming back to our use of appropriate um, catch crops in the autumn awesome time of the year. You know, it comes back to when is nitrate loss lost from, from land, nitrate will be lost on those freer draining soils when there's little or no growth. So you think of harvest time or thereafter. And when there's rainfall to drive that down through the soil into groundwater. So, you know, we come back to catch crops, um, getting them established. But I do think, Michael, we have to think about establishing those early um, not being driven by a date be it you know for gloss or whatever like that but to have your as early as possible sown so that you have a demand you're creating a demand for the nitrate in the soil and that is what really will will catch or trap that nitrate and prevent it from being lost into groundwater so i think there's there's a big conversation still to be had on the whole area of catch crops and where they can really fit in into this mix yeah, and I think you're right because there is there, there is difficulties, I suppose, trying to get those to fit into um, both winter and spring uh, systems um, because I suppose any delay in harvest in a spring system kind of pushes them very late, and um, I suppose you'd have to question their, their their usability at that stage. I just want to maybe just move on just a little bit. Um, I know time is pressing against us here a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of phosphorus, um, you mentioned that um, on the way by another issue. How has that been lost exactly from tillage farms? Because I thought that that stuck fairly well to soil. Yeah, it, it is. And I suppose that's part of the problem. Um, the biggest nutrient being lost from our farms is phosphorus. And we're all aware of the cost of it. And as you said, it, it, it's bound pretty well in soil. But 
the other issue we have off of uh, our farms is sediment loss. So if you think about it, if you're losing sediment from a farm, you're also at double risk of losing phosphorus as well. So here we're back to looking at you know, the condition of our soils, what's holding them there when we get these heavy rainfall events, what's preventing that sediment with the phosphorus bound to it from making its way into surface water drains. Because, Michael, you don't need to have a stream or a river on the farm. You just need to have some surface water drains. That's the connectivity. That's how it gets there. So looking at things, you know, practical things on farm here, we're talking about buffer areas, you know, margins that are left, that if there is a risk of soil or sediment and phosphorus bound to it being lost off farms, that there's a buffer there or a safety margin for to stop that re reaching our drains. Um, it's quite interesting to walk with tillage farmers and, and know how aware they are of their hedges, of their trees, of, of you know, habitats and things that they have grown around the farm. And now we're looking at another use of those because properly positioned, those margins and what's going in them, be the hedges or trees or whatever, are creating another protection zone, if you like, from the loss of the, that type of, of material off the farm. We know the phosphorus is predominantly lost from you know, marginal, poorer draining areas of farms. Now, we all have areas like that on the farm. It mightn't be the whole farm. It could be corners. It could be portions. It could be the bottom of hills. So it's kind of, you know, with the help of an asset advisor, identifying areas like that that are at a higher risk of losing both phosphorus or sediment off the farm and again looking at practical measures that can go in in those areas just specifically though in those areas to prevent that being lost off the farm so from what i'm getting from you fiona is that the a farmer can do an awful lot uh, to rectify some of the some of the the, the the issues that we're talking about here um, in a relatively simple manner. It's not, like you say, huge um, cost or investment. It's, it, it's probably um, lots of small incremental um, uh, changes will actually help in a big way. For guys who haven't maybe been contacted um, so far, uh, for those farmers, what um, or how can they find out about the water quality uh, in their area? Yeah, it, 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 we see guys having much more interest in, in and awareness on this. So probably one of the easiest places to start, Michael, is on the Chagas website, www.chagas.ie. Our environmental section there now has a link to water quality. Um, and it will not only give details on the ASAP program and the ASAP advisors in the area, but it will give a link to a map of Ireland, which identifies the areas I've been speaking about. So you can go in and find out, is your own area one of these? Um, there's also lots of links there to c the current status of water quality in Ireland and trends. So there's, there's quite a bit there collated together on the Chagas website um, that's freely available to farmers. Um, and like I said, the, the contact details of all the ASP advisors are there too if you did want to speak to whoever is in your local area. Okay, Fiona, look, that's great. It's been brilliant chatting to you and I'd love to come back and ch chat a little bit more um, maybe in a few months' time again just to see how the, um, the, the, the programme is uh, progressing and to see what sort of the successes, I suppose, you've identified around in that. So thanks again, Fiona. Perfect. Thank you. That's it for the Tilly Challenge this week and my thanks to Fiona for joining me on the podcast. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcast or Spotify so you never miss an episode. And for more farming information, go to chagas.ie. I'm Michael Hennessy. Thanks for listening and I'll be back next week with more tillage news and advice.